All right. Let's see. Hopefully you guys can uh, hear me and see me. I'm I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, so I have a new computer desktop that I am figuring out how to work into my setup. It's not the not what I wanted to do, not the expenditure I wanted to make uh, right now, but it had to be done. So great time to support, <laughs> support the channel if you'd like. Uh, my zine is also, also, I'm rapidly approaching the finish line, so that'll be something that, that I can point people towards. Uh, I also have Patreon and whatnot if you want to help out. And thanks to Patreons for making the uh, patrons and folks for making the landing a little, uh, <clears throat> a little less sharp than it could have been. Um, at the moment, I'm trying something. I do have Windows 11, Frederick, I think. Yes. Uh, I, I'm trying something that we'll see at work. So I actually have my laptop, is, which is not totally kaput. I think maybe I was tasking it too much and, and, and maybe age and, and things not working quite as well. But I'm seeing how this works. So, and I did a test stream of this earlier on Twitch. I meant to stream it to YouTube too. It just, I don't know, whatever happened, it just only went to Twitch, which is fine because it was just me kind of goofing around the test stream where I was using the new computer to run uh, essentially the RPG stories on Steam, but then using the laptop as the actual stream host. So I was using, I have a device that allows me to take, you know, an HDMI input and spit it out as essentially a USB like for a, uh, that, that appears as a webcam. And this way I can kind of lighten the load on the old laptop. Since I have everything set up on the laptop and I don't have everything set up on the desktop yet, settings and one I thought well maybe I'll give this a try and see if see how the laptop works see how the laptop works in terms of if just with just with running just with kind of the webcam this kind of setup it might work uh, so we'll see so if there are any hiccups that could be could be the issue hopefully there won't be there weren't any this morning other than, well, I had a little bit at the beginning but I don't think that was really the laptop so much as just me doing this for the first time and this is a green tea, jasmine green tea from Many Worlds Tavern for the working man today. But we're putting all that aside. We're going to look at Morgan's Fort, the Western Lands campaign, which is a uh, a game campaign for two to eight beginning player characters that was written for the basic fantasy uh, role playing game BFRPG. This is totally a free download. I think you can. Uh, you can get printed copies, I think, via Lulu, maybe even through drive through I just downloaded this from the Basic Fantasy website. So uh, that one is there. There, I did notice that the version number is a little bit different. I don't know what the substantive, if, if the changes between the version, which I just downloaded this morning, that's, I think, V38, version 2, number 38. And I think there's the it's a slightly earlier version for print. I don't I don't know if the I haven't gone through and done any cataloging of the changes, so I'm not sure. So if you have an older printed copy that you're following along with, just keep that in mind. So that one. Um, oh, Ian says they've been looking over more Morgan's for periodically. Cool. Yeah, it, it seems like, and I kind of I made some I don't know if puns is the right word, but I sort of see it feels like this is the keep on the borderlands for basic fantasy. There's more to it, I guess, because they, they, there's more content here. It's not just a keep and then one dungeon, but we'll see. Frederick, if you buy me the Black Sword hack, will I review it? I would, Frederick, but please don't please don't buy it for me. Uh, I'll reach out and see if maybe the creators can send me, if they're interested, uh, send it to me. Um, it seems like that's kind of the new... I saw a lot of people posting their images. I guess, it's, I guess people are... Backers and other folks are getting it in the mail now, the physical copies. So I've seen lots of lots of lovely looking pictures of, of the books. Is that is, is it becoming it seems like is this now the become the de facto? I guess maybe it's too early to tell, but it seems like this is now the it just seems like well, because it's new, I guess it's the cult of the new, right? Everyone's jumping on this as sort of the the top of the heap in terms of black hack hacks. I don't know, we'll see. All right, so yeah, second edition, release 38, intro. And, and remember, I'm doing this now. I'm not going to read through every paragraph. I'm going to try to get to the high points, get to the 
get to the meat of the matters. If I miss anything that you think needs going over, shout it out to me in the chat and I will try to oblige. If you're watching this later and I miss something, sorry. All right, intro. Morgan's Fort, the Westlands campaign is a campaign module, a group of connected adventures for the basic fantasy role-playing game. This module is intended for two to eight beginning, i.e. first level player characters, and furthermore is suitable for beginning players as well, i.e. folks who are new to the game. There are several parts to this module. We have the Western Lands campaign adventure area consisting of the remnants of a once great empire, a pair of important free cities, and quite a lot of wilderness territory. And we got a page reference. Thanks for that. We get Morgan's Fort, a home base for adventures set in the Western Lands southeast of Slate Home. We got a page reference for that. The Old Island Fortress, a two level dungeon environment suitable for beginning adventures that's located near Morgan's Fort. We get the Nameless Dungeon, a three-level dungeon set a day's travel north of Morgan's Fort. It may be played directly after the Old Fort Fortress is cleared, or if the GM wishes, the player characters can proceed directly to the Cave of the Unknown. And then we have the Cave of the Unknown, a one-level dungeon filled with strange monsters controlled by an unusual master. Not the Caves of Chaos. These are the Caves of the Unknown. And then, uh, let's see, we might choose to introduce the Cave of the Unknown while the player characters are in Morgan's Fort. Um, Something I just thought about when you download this from the Basic Fantasy, if you download it from the Basic Fantasy website, the the cover is a separate PDF, and so is the map. So I'm not sure if they'll show a copy of the map. I can see about maybe I can think about pulling it up at the end. Uh, let's see. Oh, Ian saying about uh about a black sword hack that it has. Mary Mushman art and layout, so it's very pretty. There is a regional map. Yeah, there's a regional map. I, I don't know if we'll see. Oh, you mean in the book, Michael Anderson? All right, we'll just, I'll just keep scrolling and then we'll see. There it is. Okay, so this doesn't have the hexes on it because the one, the other one has hexes, but uh, we do get this kind of regional map. I believe Morgan's Fort, there we are. It's right down there. So you've got a lot of areas. So this is a nice, nice home base. So I think the first thing, if you remember from Keep on the Borderlands, which originally came with the basic set, at least I don't know if it came with it originally because there was also what uh, into the whatever B there was B one, and then there was B two. But I think at least my version, at least the I think the classic B X box, I, I'm pretty sure the Keep on the Borderlands was with it. You didn't get a, a large regional. Uh, map and in terms of the dungeon, I think there, I think you do get a map of Greyhawk or wherever. I think I have, hold on a minute, I'm stumbling around on my words and I think I have it right here. So, in the original, yes, I do have it actually. In the original map, you just basically get well, there's the map of the caves. Do we even get? I know there's a Hold on a minute. I know it's riveting, riveting streaming here as I'm flipping through trying to find it. Yeah, here we go. Let's see. So, just to switch here, this is the map in Keep on the Borderlands, right? So, you get a nice, this is not a region. This is really just a, lo a locality where the, where the, where the keep, where the keep is. So, for Morgan's Fort, and they're really giving you a lot more of the area. They are, in a sense, integrating, integrating the hex crawl right away as opposed to, the hex crawl elements, let's call them, right away, as opposed to what you might see in basic expert, whereas really they wait until the expert set to give you, and I'm just going to try to see if I can find it really quick. I think it's they have a map here in the back, don't they? Am I wrong about it? Here we go. So we do get, we do get that in the expert set, but it's not integrated with the adventure. So here they're kind of integrating, integrating this all together for you, which is nice. All right. So we are getting some, I'm going to skip over all the, these places, but we just get a rundown of kingdoms, regions, and free cities, which is great. You can find them on the map. So you have some island over here. We have a few islands. I'm guessing this is some icy area with some mountains and then more, a lot of forest. It looks like forest. We get some things about religion, the Druids, the Hundred Gods, the Church of Ta, a.k.a. the Bethite Church, the Church of Ta Reformed, and then evil, evil Clerics. 
Now we get, this is more like your classic keep on the borderlands lo lo locality sort of map. So we have Morgoth's Fort here, and then that original dungeon, right? The old island fortress there. And now we get Morgan's Fort. We get some rules for move movement. And now we have a nice little isometric map of Morgan's Fort with the main locations. So we've got a gambling house, a warehouse, tavern, an inn, a stable, stableman's residence, a trader, trader, as in trades for goods, not a traitor who will sell you to the warden. Uh, a bank, and then another stable, and then ar smithy slash armor ore. Yes, thanks, Michael Anderson. I didn't mention before, but I will mention again, the PDF is absolutely free. You just got to go to the, uh, I, I linked in the show notes to the basic fantasy website and download it. Absolutely free. Uh, I don't know about Ironwood Gorge, but it sounds like I have to put that on my list. And then we have some more stuff. A lot of things here and then more oh it's kind of i like how it's kind of breaking down different areas it's kind of uh i don't want to say schematic kind of drawing but the way they've they've broken it to show you different portions and then put the elements in those portions that's cool so we have you know garrisons stables a greens an herbalist a square and then towers and yada 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 we got all that stuff all that kind of all that kind of stuff so i'm, I'm kind of scrolling quickly through here but this is all the kind of nice stuff you have in your home base when I talked to Matt Finch, if you haven't seen that interview that I did last week, you should check it out. I guess a week a week ago today, you know, he talked about how what he felt like was a good setup for your first adventure, and and, and I I think I kind of agree with him too. Like it, it's a you know a home base, a little bit of a crawl, and then kind of a, a dungeon and keep on the board. That's really is the keep on the borderlands formula, and then Morgan's Fort is taking that formula and then expanding it out. So it's giving you. Whereas if you go with the keep, just classically, you end up going through the keep and then you're like, well, what do we do after this? And then they have Mike's World, which does sort of a similar thing, which then takes and expands the world. Or you can go into, I showed the map from the expert set and, and, and kind of push it out there into more stuff. But there's a lot more work there. Whereas probably just a factor of, hey, that this, this module has had a lot of time to reflect on all the things that keep and all kinds of other modules have done is to then give you that kind of keep setup where, yeah, we have this little spot that's pretty close to the town and you can work in that area, but then we're going to give you more of that world just built into the module. You don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to go out because we're going to essentially expand the material from the keep to give it more legs, if you will, out of the box. Oh, Ian says that the books are at cost, so typically about $5 or less. Cool. How is the quality in the books, Ian? Do you know, I, I've, I've, I've not held one in hand. I hear I hear fairly good things about Lulu, Lulu in terms of printing, but I, I haven't actually used it myself. No, wait, I have used, no, I got to wait. I have used Lulu before, but it's been ages, and I can't even remember what I had printed there. So, so our first location here is the Old Island Fortress. And we have a section here on starting the adventure, which I will notice. We also have some NPCs that are in town that I, I'm kind of I, I gloss I gloss over, but we have individuals here like this bailiff and the baronet and some other folks. So we do have it's not uh, it's it's uh, it is fleshed out. I'm just I'm just kind of skidding over it, skidding, skipping, skimming over it. Starting in the adventure, if your players are experienced at playing this sort of game, feel free to start the adventure at the gates of Morgan's Fort, role-playing the scene where the adventurers identify themselves to the guards. Uh, identify themselves to the guards. Wait, hold on. Role-playing role -playing the scene where the adventurers identify themselves to the guards can serve as a sort of introduction, and many players enjoy the role-play opportunity with Morgan's Fort itself. One problem such a group must solve is how to cross the river. If you wish, you may make this easier by providing an abandoned boat or raft near the ruined bridge. Such a boat might be prone to sinking if it is overloaded. Allow a normal check for traps to detect this infirmity. If your players are beginners or just impatient, the following description will get them directly into the action. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I, yep, no, that was me. Thank you. Sorry. I switched up to show the expert set and I didn't switch back. So there we go. All right. 
So, uh, you know, you could start at Morgan's Fort doing the banter if your party likes that sort of thing, or we have some box text to get you straight into the action pretty much if you need to. I'll go back to this map really quick just to show uh, there. Let's see. So there's a Morgan's Fort. This is a river, and I guess there's a ruined bridge somewhere. Is that it here? Are we talking about? No, I guess we're talking about here. This must be the ruined bridge. That would have been, might have been nice to label. It's somewhat obvious, but... There's a little bit of an element here, like in um, haunt was it haunting horror on the hill, I think, in which you had to get across the river or make accommodations to get across the river, and then it could be sticky getting back because it the river the river's a nice barrier. It's a nice barrier to explain why some of the stuff that's out in the borderlands or wilderness or whatever area dangerous hasn't come over and attacked the town because it's not caught they haven't crossed the river on the flip side it's a nice element to for the party to have to try to plan right it's that obstacle well yeah the dangerous stuff can't get across to us which is great as long as we're on the side of the river but we also want to get across how do we do that in this case we have this ruined bridge and potentially you can either have the party figure it out or if you want to give them a viable tool right off the bat to uh, to get across, you can, but it's there for you. We have a section here on random encounters, and Horror on the Hill had that same thing. The thing with Horror on the Hill is you had to, uh, you were you didn't have to, but it was wise to try to, to get your return passage. Like you could book passage over and someone would drop you, but it, there was a little note, I think, that was like, well, you, you probably, if you're a player, you probably want to book your passage back and, or have some kind of sign to get help because if you're on the run and you get to the river, you probably want to be able to flag somebody or do something that can uh, get their attention so you can get back across because once you're over there, you're trapped with the bad things. I'm not going to go through all the random encounters in depth. I do like this format they have here with the encounters where it gives you, it not only gives you the hit points, but it gives you some check boxes you can fill to track. Now, I probably wouldn't want to use this in my one printed version of the book, though some people do. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I, I get, I get queasy when I see people marking up <laughs> books like that. If I'm going to use it, especially if I'm going to use it more than once, of course you have the PDF, but it's just kind of a nice touch where if I need to track, I can just check off the boxes. And when I fill them all up, then that thing is dead. So we have some Caecilia, we have some giant crab spiders, we have some goblins, some kobolds, some skeletons, and some sturges. So some good, good standard sort of D and D monsters. Good things to get your feet wet. Now into the old island fortress itself. Yeah, Michael says, copy the page or just make some scratch paper to hold your boxes. Yep, but I like that they give it to you, right? It does mean that they're... It's one of those things that I appreciate because when you can see it laid out here, you do lose a, a fair, ch a good chunk of real estate. I mean, it, it extends the size of your book, not insignificantly. Every time you have a set of monsters... You're taking a big block because that could all be on one line. Almost this whole piece, this list could end up on this page. But they do that, you know, and I appreciate that they, hey, it's not the most efficient from a layout if we're just trying to squeeze the most on a page, but it's a nice usability piece, I guess. W says, please do my own version of Expedition to the Barrier Peaks Lost Laboratory of Qualish at some point. I have Barrier Peaks. I will definitely do. I don't know if I have Lost Laboratory of Qualish, but I love Barrier Peaks, so I would be happy to do Barrier Peaks at some point. Have I done it already? I don't think so. Did I do Barrier Peaks already? Man, I've, I've, been, I've been at this too long. Getting old. I can't even remember if I've done Barrier Peaks. If I haven't done it, I probably haven't. I'm trying to remember. Probably haven't. I will do it. I will do it. Hey, I can do it again. If I did it once, I'll just do it again. It's It'll be like new to me because I'm a big fan of Barrier Peaks. So we have some... So let's see. We got level one. Where's the map for level one? Do we have a map for level one? Not yet. I'm, I, I don't... The one thing is... So I guess something to keep in mind, right? This is These are all works in progress. I, I they, they do a lot of versions. As I said, this is version two, number 38. So they've got... Big version two, little version 38. It's doing a lot of changes. The I'm not going to go through all the rooms, but we can just see that the layout, the way the rooms are structured, it's in the old school way. You know, 
boxed read aloud text notes monsters kind of thing so it's it, it might be one of those things if you really favor the the sort of dolman wood uh, into the odd the kind of newer newer sort of style of presentation of your dungeons this isn't it not hard to read depending on how you feel about read aloud text i know because i know i had to read from i did hear from some folks that um not not necessarily um not that they didn't like the layouts of some of the new ones, but that some people really do appreciate the read aloud text. I saw some notes that some people were saying, hey, I don't feel like I have a great descriptive voice or that, I, you know, or, or I just I'm not good at making descriptions. I don't feel like I'm, that's a strong suit for me. So giving me a bunch of bullet points with smells or things I have to put together myself is not helpful. I'd like to have some theoretically better written you know, something more descriptive, something more thought out that I can say than having to come up with it on the spot, which on the spot, which I can appreciate. Now, I, I mean, I might say you're probably not giving yourself enough credit and these are skills you can learn, but if you don't like it or it's not for you, I totally get it. So there's some, for some folks, the older, older style is, is perfectly good, but just keep that in mind that this, this is not the, we're not at the cutting edge of module or, or adventure or sort of book design in terms of the layout but that is okay it's worked well enough for i don't know 50 years it's working well enough still the maps are all at the end of the adventure okay maybe i'll let's skip ahead oh, let's see oops i think i did I pass it oh yeah i also noticed and i guess because these are all like i mentioned work in progress you do get where did i just roll scroll by here we go art needed because they're filling it in I don't know what these look like if if you go to the print version. I'm guessing in the print copy. Well, I don't want to. I mean, I should, probably shouldn't even guess. I'm gonna imagine you're not getting this block in the print copy. That maybe it's blank or it's just not there. I'm not sure. So keep in mind that we might see some of those, and that's because these are all sort of maybe even continual works in progress. So here we have the map for level one. And we can see these are in the sort of what I don't know what you call. It. I, I don't know. I don't know if these are by Dyson logos or just in that sort of style. But we're getting some kind of. We got some loopiness here. There's one kind of loop here. That yeah, we got one loop here. We got a loop over here. WJS, how hard is this to convert to Palladium Fantasy or Rifts? Man, I couldn't tell you. I need to do Palladium Fantasy at some point. WJ. I owned some Rift books and I adored them, but I ne never used them for the rules. Use them for, they're all like inspirational materials. Um, I don't know. I guess WJ, I would say, and this is going to be not helpful at all. I don't think this would be any harder to convert than anything other OSR type thing. If you've converted or if there are conversion guidelines for, let's say, keep on the Borderlands or other BX material to Palladium Fantasy, then I would say this is not going to be any harder than that. But I couldn't tell you in terms of work involved. I, I, I need to, I want to, I do want to look at some of the Palladium stuff because I find it super interesting, even though I've never played it myself. But I, I unfortunately, I don't have any guidance to give you. But maybe someone who's one to watching is in here now or watches later can hip us to some wisdom on conversion. I, I think the main thing that I would do if I was converting, if I was converting this from, so just any other system, right? I, I want to play this, but maybe I'm using GURP. So I'm using something that's, I guess, using something that's fairly different from D and D or and and OSR type games. Obviously, you can use the layout. Layouts of the dungeons are fine; they're not going to change. Nothing changes there. The uh, social stuff, the you know, the land, the the hooks, the plot hooks, where everything is, how, that's fine, right? All the NPCs, great. Now, you really, that's okay. It's mechanics. Probably the first thing I would do is, is there an analog for what I'm trying to do? Is, okay, if there are goblins in, which I'm assuming, okay, I go to Palladium Fantasy, that uh, goblins exist in this other game, or there's some kind of analog, then I would just grab that analog. I wouldn't try to convert, if, if there's a version of something that exists in the game I'm going converting to, I wouldn't try to do the conversion myself, just use those. So we have... Oh, I don't know. Let's just, oh, what do we got here? So we have giant beetles. If I can bombardier beetles, if I can find giant beetles in the book, I'll probably just replace them. I wouldn't worry about, oh, these are bombardier beetles. Well, maybe the bombardier beetles mean it has a spray. I could probably figure out how to add a spray attack if it's super necessary. 
oh, here I have carnivorous apes. Let me find out the nearest ape analog. And I would probably go through and do that. And the same for the NPCs. Oh, uh, if it's a, cl if, you know, if, I don't know if play in fantasy is class-based or skill-based. I'd want to figure out what is basically a fighter, let's say. And then I can figure out what, what the fighter NPCs are like. And that's kind of what I would do. And then obviously if you have things like traps, you're going to want to figure out how that works. It, it's, it can be, it can, it can be, a, it can be a lot of work, but it can also be kind of fulfilling if you do it. Kevin Sambiata, I, I never know how to pronounce his name. So apologies for that. It's hard to work with at times if doing third party stuff for Palladium Fantasy or Rips. Well, that's kind of stinks. I mean, I would, I, I would hope, I mean, he's been doing this a long time. It's one of those things I always feel like, you know, rifts. I just remember, you know, there are certain games that have big footprints, or at least I remember back when I, I lived in Houston for a long time in Texas. And there was a, there's, there's basically like a, I don't know if it's not the only one, certainly not now, but the kind of old school gaming stores, this place called Nan's, I, I imagine it's still there. And I was in rifts and there was a bunch of these games that had fairly large footprints in terms of the shelving space. But you never heard, or at least I never ran into anybody who ever played them. And Rifts was one of those. But, but I was playing this, uh, I was playing in a home, a totally homebrew fantasy, uh, not fantasy game, sorry, science fiction game. And the Rifts stuff, the the, the sort of sci-fi Rifts things we used to use, just we just didn't use the mechanics. We used the just the, the inspiration, the draw, you know, the art, all the, all that kind of stuff. Um, like Torg is another one. Right? I remember seeing Torg all the time, but I don't remember. I don't think I've ever run any, into anybody in the wild who's playing Torg. I've never seen a game of Torg run anywhere, but Torg always, I always remember seeing the books. I mean, I guess somebody must be running. I just never ran into it. Steve Jackson is from Texas. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if he's from Houston though, but if you're ever in Houston, go to Nan's. It's if it's assuming it's still there, it's like the it's the gaming store that time forgot. And here in New York City, the analog would be the uh, complete strategist, which has been around forever. Nans has got a little more breathing room. Complete strategist feels like it's gonna collapse into a black hole of 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 gaming tabletop at some point. It's just it's so stuffed and it's gonna reach some kind of over density of material and just implode. Still worth a visit. Now we have the nameless dungeon. Here's level two of our old island fortress. Level two, more linear, but that's okay. The American Auto Duelist Association. Is that from Car Wars? I remember had very finely, fine memories of Car Wars. Hey, Brian Smith. So the Nameless Dungeon is about a day's march north of Morgan's Fort. So here we have, we had dungeon number one, old island fortress, Two levels, your sort of beginner dungeon. Close, to, easy enough to get back and forth. The party goes through. And I, I don't know. So classically, a lot oftentimes the levels of dungeons would essentially be fairly close to what you could get through in a session. So you would have the party go in. They'd go to level one. They would find not, not necessarily everything, but they would find the majority of stuff in level one. And then at the end of the session, they would retire. And, and that was a good gauge. Obviously, you're playing longer sessions then. So maybe now, nowadays, depending on your session length, you might find that a level might take you longer. But probably two levels, you would think, is about two sessions worth. You finish that up. Each one, you know, you go back to town, rest, heal, resupply, get new people if you need to, get more hirelings if you need to, whatever, whatever. Throw it out again. So we've done that one. And that's and this is and that is for hey, you guys are new to the game. New to the game. Here's your first, your kind of Tomb of the Serpent Kings type situation. I don't know if it has as much kind of learning going on. I don't know if it's as tricksy in things, but that's essentially where they're trying to feed you, right? Okay, you're you're new, you're new, new, new. Let's try to get you over to the island fortress, which makes sense because it is within that day's march. Now we put this other one. A bit further away, meaning it's going to take more effort to get to. You're not. You're out of your comfort zone a little bit, so you're you're going to have to. So now a day's march means that you can't just run back to Morgan's Fort by you know. You can't leave in the morning, get back in the evening. You're going to spend at least one day on the road, depending on when you leave. Might even be a little bit longer. So we think one assumes new players. You'll go for the lowest hanging fruit. Go to the old island. 
now we've done that. We, we maybe we've gotten a level or or two. I don't know. I didn't look at the loot. So now it's like, okay, well, now we're, we're ready for something else. Here we have the Nameless Dungeon, which would probably put it in like number two. Now, of course, given this is open world and Sam, you know, who knows what your party may do? They may go for the Nameless Dungeon first, but you, you can kind of see how we're trying to set. They're trying to set things up in a certain order without, you know, railroading you through one or the other. But you can see that those distances help sort of push try to funnel the party towards towards the easier thing first. So the Nameless Dungeon, it's about a day's march away down the old road. You'll have to come up with some reason for your player characters to travel north. Perhaps they're going to town, to a town a few days march up the road to purchase something or to sell off some gems or jewelry found in the old, old island fortress. They shouldn't be in too much of a hurry, though. The action begins after the player characters make camp beside the road in a wooded area. On the first watch of the night, goblins attack. The goblin party should be between one and a half and two times as many goblins as party members, fewer if they are lower in level, more if higher. The goblins will try to attack with surprise. The goblins will flee, roll a morale check, but ignore the result before it is too late to do so. If the player characters give chase, after two or three rounds of pursuit, one of the PCs, probably the lead PC unless they're very lightweight, falls as the ground gives way. Proceed to the first numbered encounter area. Okay, so this is interesting. So we're not, this is actually a different sort of setup. This setup is, you're not necessarily trying to get to this dungeon. You're trying to get somewhere else, and this is going to happen on the road, which is interesting. It's a bit more of a, I would almost, the interesting thing about this is this to me feels like almost a sort of Lost Minds kind of starting, right? Lost Minds, you get a job, but then really the game starts. I mean, some people will role play the getting of the job, but really the game starts with the sort of goblin ambush, right? You're in the situation, and then you know, the, what? There's a wagon across the road, goblins attack, and then the first dungeon is essentially you following the trail that the goblins left, and follow it back to the the their uh, whatever the name of the first dungeon is. This is a bit similar, right? Except you're gonna they're gonna, they're the goblins are gonna attack, then they're gonna flee. And then you fall in the dungeon. Now, that's a little bit, I don't know, gamey, I'll put in quotes, right? Because the goblins, you're going to flee, not because they're really morale fails. I mean, you're going to basically force a morale fail. And I think they they have you roll the dice so that it doesn't give away. It's like, oh, I'm behind the screen. But, oh, um, the goblins failed the morale check and they run. But the reality is this is what they're going to do. And then, I mean, the PCs are almost always going to give chase. I imagine, unless they're super hurt for some reason that they're not going to run after it. And then you kind of get to what the, the dungeon is, which is presumably the, <laughs> the lead lead player character falling into it, I guess, which is begins numbered area. Number one, Brian Smith says it's kind of a big gamble in lost minds. Like you tell new players, they have this mission to get to town and then count on them, ignoring that to chase. It is a bit. Yeah, it, it totally is. It seems like it must work okay. The, the numbers must work out because you don't... In, in all the complaints, and not that I have some kind of systematic documentation on this, but when I read up on people's issues with that adventure in general or with that intro, it doesn't tend to be that players don't give chase. It tends to be that it's too deadly. Right? So, But it is interesting because, yeah, it does count on you. It does count on the party to take a specific action. So here we have some notes on what happens, I guess, some alternatives. If they do, if the party does not give chase but retires back to their camp, then on the last watch of the night, another force of goblins, this time larger, will attack. Again, they will fail a morale check and flee, and the events described above will hopefully occur. So if the small group of goblins doesn't work, then send a larger group. I don't know. And that, that's, does that, I don't know if that, that follows, but I. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Cause I feel like if I saw, okay, wave one of goblins comes and they flee and we don't give chase probably cause we're, if we don't give chase, why? Well, we're, we're on our way somewhere. So maybe we've decided that that is more important and we don't want to, we don't want to know about these goblins. I don't know then if sending a larger numbers cause I feel like, okay, Hey, goblins attack the campsite and we fight them off. They ran away and we're like, man, we're too tired. I just want to get to town. Now, like a doubled size of goblins comes back. That to me is my my sign to get the heck out of Dodge, not to chase them down. I don't know. Maybe the maybe maybe the players, maybe the basic fantasy role players are a lot more bloodthirsty than I am. But I'm thinking if if the whatever the four eight goblins, and then they then they come back with sixteen or twelve. 
Uh, I'm not thinking that as a sign that I should go after them. Kyle says it sets up a nice DM versus players dynamic. Well, I think the thing is, Kyle, they're not really supposed to be aware that you're co trying to coke lure them, lure them in there. Uh, it, it probably it would be not. It, I could see though maybe having a note saying like, "Hey, we're just trying to get the adventure started. Like this isn't you. Like I maybe because I think this is positioned a little bit like it could be for new players and new. I I, I include new dungeon masters and with new players that maybe a little note saying, "Hey, we're not trying. This is not really." this is kind of an exception to the rules of what you should be doing. You shouldn't really be relying on this because if you, I would hate for people to come and, and say like, Oh, this is how I'm going to start all my adventures. Like this one where I'm essentially using kind of, I don't know. I don't want to say dirty tricks, but kind of meta tricks to get the party to do what I want. Um, between turns four and 18 after the party enters the dungeon, goblin war parties may be encountered. Okay, so this is once they're in. After turn 18, only goblin scouts will be seen. The goblin chief wants the dungeon as a new lair. After turn 18, the goblin parties are recalled as the goblin chief has realized by then that the player characters are doing the hard work of clearing the dungeon. He plans to allow them to complete the job, then ambush them just outside the dungeon. If the player characters survive this attack and wish to follow any fleeing goblins home, create the goblin, creating the goblin lair is left to the jam. So this is pretty interesting. So the, really what's happening here is we have this faction of goblins who are interested in the dungeon. And they're going to be showing up in the dungeon, but then they're going to, once word gets around that the party's here doing this work, they're going to retire because they're like, oh, okay, let, well, instead of us banging heads with you, we're just going to sit back and, and wait for you to clear the dungeon. And then we'll kill. we'll try to kill you on your way out or take you out. I kind of like, so I think, so I, I like, so the bones of this is interesting, but I don't know if I like the execution of this. I mean, it's very kind of classic in a sense, but I really like so the approach that I think about the, the black worm of Brand, Brandon's, black wear, worm of Brandon'sford, where it had kind of a goblin, it, it also had kind of a goblin chieftain in with some goblins that definitely had a goal. But you could kind of work with the goblins, like you could really treat them as a full, a fully fleshed out faction, which we're not getting here. We're not given as a GM, and obviously you have the latitude to do whatever the heck you want, which is what I would do. I would scrap, I think I would scrap this intro and say, hey, you're on, you're on the road, and maybe run into some goblins who are acting pitiful and or or some way and like have you work with like I would set up the goblins as this faction who might be willing or try to either trick you, lure you, maybe even make a bargain with you to clear out the dungeon. Something like that. Give you some options. <clears throat> make the make the nameless dungeon something that maybe you're trying to go to. Maybe somebody accosts you out on the road like, you know, they have this whole thing of hey, you're on the road. Well, maybe maybe this is where someone's waiting on the road and they're trying to get you to clean out the dungeon. Maybe they Say, oh, somebody went in there, and I, my, my, my daughter, my dog, my son, my husband, my pappy, my grandpappy went down in the hole and didn't come out. Something like that to kind of get you in, and then this you can play with the you can play with the goblins. Maybe this person by the side of the road is actually being employed by the goblins because the goblins know that, or they assume that if they were to stand by the side of the road and try to make this deal, people wouldn't trust them because it's as human centric and they're goblins and there's goblin racism in the world, whatever. Uh, but maybe if they pay this person to hang about and and try to get somebody to do it, then they'll do that. And then, like at the other end, when they're coming out of the dungeon, why would you kill the party? Unless you feel like the party's going to make this their lair, just wait for them to leave, and then you swoop in. It's a kind of a weird thing. Like, you don't have to kill them unless you don't want them to know that the dungeon is here. I mean, that's... Maybe there's a thing of, like... Uh, we, we, we want this to be our secret layer and now you know our secret kind of thing. But you can almost, have, maybe you could have some more, make it a little bit more nuanced. I think you can have some interesting stuff with this. I'm not sure I love this setup, but you, we can we can make do about this. I don't want, I'm not trying to get sidetracked on it, but you know, this is what I do. Sorry. Ian says, uh, honestly, Lost Minds runs well whether the players chase the goblins or they continue to town because they immediately have a person who's going to tell them to find the missing folk. Ah, uh, yes, that's true. I didn't even think about that. Uh, Brian Smith says, it is interesting that this adventure is counting on the chase so hard. Yes, it is. It is. I, it's, I, I think it's, 
it's I think it's probably because of the conceit. This is one of those things, and again, I don't want to put my words into the authors of this adventure's mouths, but as a GM, sometimes you can get really fixated on an idea, which is the idea that this dungeon is nameless, i.e. it is unknown, and that these goblins want it on the down low. And so you build everything on the fact that, well, the, the players can't know the dungeons here because it's unknown. And so you end up kind of putting yourself in a little bit of a pretzel trying to, I want, I got, I want to get the players to the dungeon, but the dungeon's got to be unknown. So I got to do this and I got to do this, whatever. And it's I almost feel like maybe uh, it being a little known, or like I said, they do some kind of plan where they try to, the, the, the goblins play some operatives to try to get the party by hook or by crook to come explore it. It can still be unknown. Maybe now it's just known by a couple of people, you know, whatever. Like, I feel like you could work with it, but if you get too wrapped up in it, no, it must be this and it must be that for these reasons, then you can kind of get, get yourself where you end up relying on, on a conceit that may not work. I, I mean, this, this is a fairly well-known module and I haven't read up on all the comments and things about it, whether people had issues with this, getting the parties to it. So it might be much ado about something that isn't actually a problem, but it's interesting because my first impulse is if I didn't follow them the first time, the second time I might be less inclined to follow. And then, you know, what's happening. Um, WJ says, I know Seth Sork Sork Skorkowski is very anti-player versus GM did a whole video on it. Yeah. I, I think it, it's, I mean, I'm against it too. I think sometimes it gets a little bit overplayed in the sense that sure, as a GM, you know, your players goof up, something bad happens and you go like, yeah, I gotcha, whatever, but it's not really a serious thing. But I do know that there are GMs out there who are very serious about it being kind of anti player. And my whole perspective is that the, as a GM, in terms of what I'm doing mechanically, I may have a rooting interest. I, I usually I want the players to succeed. Sometimes there's a bad guy. I'm like, yeah, I'd like him to succeed too, but I keep that on the side. I'm like a referee. That's why I like the term referee in general for a, a game master or a dungeon masters, because it's an impartiality. That at least we wish that referees, we hope that referees have, which is you may love the home team. You may love the away team. Well, when you get in between the lines, you just kind of call it as you see it fairly. And that's why I think of that term fair is I'm not calling it. I'm not trying to make something happen for one side. I'm not trying to make something happen for the other side. I'm just trying to call it where it lies on the field. And, and that's how it is. And that's kind of where I come out. Most of the times I want the players to do well. Every once in a while, there may be a bad guy that I'm like, man, I really like this character. I'd like them to, to, to live. But if they die, then they die. Or there's a, it could be a hireling, could be a, any kind of NPC, something else. Oh man, I wish they would do that, but they don't, but they don't, you know, but the, the, I think you always just want to be playing it fair. Now I know some people like to lean the other direction and kind of, Oh, I want to make it for the players. But as a player, I don't like that. I don't want the game twisting and turning to try to make sure that I'm having something like, I want to feel like I did it myself. If I got, if I went and did this badass thing, I want to feel like, yeah, that was me. I made the right calls. I got lucky with the dice. These things were and like, I did that. Not like, Oh, the GM sort of, put it there kind of for me you know if i get wind of that it kind of takes the if, if i if i get the sense that that's happening in the game it takes the wind out of my sails as a player but everybody's everybody's you know everybody's everybody's different because part for me the gaminess what i appreciate as a game is this idea of me as the player against this world this world wants to kill me take away my stuff whatever and i want to try to rip as many levels and stuff as i can before I get got or until I can retire. So I look at those victories of leveling up, victories of finding stuff, victories of not dying. And that's in the game, in terms of the game part of it, that's the draw to me. And if I feel like it's not being called sort of down the middle, one way or the other, like monsters who aren't dying because it's convenient or monsters that are dying because it's convenient, not because I did something or didn't do something, then I, I kind of lose my faith in the game. If that makes sense. So we got a whole bunch of goblins. We got carnivorous apes. We got shadows. We have ghouls, tiger beetles. We got a bunch of goblin warriors. We have goblin scouts. We have goblin archers. We have the goblin captain. I like this. A lot of folks have trouble with, well, what do I do if I have, want the party to encounter a lot of goblins? And the answer is to differentiate your goblins and insert any other kind of uh, homogenized, what you, what you might think of as sort of a hom homogenous culture or unit so you don't just have goblins so you have goblin warriors 
you have five goblin scouts, you have goblin archers, right? And what happens is it's not just that you have these, though you can, it's you can start to mix and match. And I don't even know if they're really doing that here. But and I like that there's you have a you have a finite total. There's 22 total goblin warriors. When you run out of them, you're out. They're not coming around again. You got seven scouts, you have 10 archers, and you have three captains. But what you can do is so you have your goblins, and you say, okay, I got goblins. Now the most of the goblin, most of the goblin forces here are those warriors. Great. They're going to be the majority of any encounter force of goblins is going to be goblin warriors. But then we can mix in. There might be, might you might run into an encounter of just goblin warriors, or you might run into an encounter of a couple of goblin scouts and some goblin warriors. You might run into a couple of goblin, some goblin warriors, scout, maybe a couple of archers and a captain. You might run into warriors and a captain. You might run into archers and a captain. You might run into archers and scouts. You might run into scouts and captains. You can see how you could take these four we have four basic types of goblins we went from just kind of one homogenous blob of goblin to four subtypes of goblins and now we can take those four subtypes of goblins and mix and match them into you know what is it 16 or whatever different um you know different versions of these goblin forces and then these will operate differently i would hope in an, in an encounter with the goblin warriors who have spears or short swords they're going to act differently than the scouts who have a little bit less armor class, less hit points in general. The archers are from range, but they can also close with short swords, but they don't have great hit points. But so you want to treat them separately. The warriors are going to act a certain way. Scouts will act a certain way. The archers will act a certain way. And of course, the captains will act a certain way. So you can, you can get a lot of mileage over just having goblins because you're mixing and matching the sort of goblins that you are seeing if that makes sense. And then we have the rooms. We have Spitting Cobra Lair. We've got, what is that guy? Who's this guy? Oh, I'm not sure if that's a guy. Is it a guy or is it just a, I'm not sure. Narrow room. No, we've got fire beetles, a spear trap, a skeleton room. He's not a skeleton room. I'm not sure who that guy is, but he's, Looks like he's ready to kill you with fire. Oracle room. The right bent room. A teleporter. Always nice to have a teleporter. Some giant bees. Let me get level two. I just want to get through here. It's art needed. Art. Art, art Vandalay. This is art needed. Brian Smith says, I like to give the goblins in Fendelver a beloved trinket like an old hat or something simple. Gives them something to bargain with for their lives, except a better version. Oh, or accept a better version of it for bribes. And the PCs loot their trinkets with abandon and end up wearing random goblin hats and trinkets. Oh, that's good. I like that, Brian Smith. WJ says, old magic had nice goblins. Squee became a nabob big shot. Oh, cool. Yeah, it'd be cool to do the trinkets. What, what you should do, Brian Smith, is I would even add, if you haven't thought of it, is if the PCs are wearing trinkets, have that affect the morale or reactions of further goblins. Maybe for the negative. For example, you know, if you, you, you encounter goblin group A and your party slaughters them, takes their hats and trinkets and starts wearing them around like trophies, when they come up against goblin group B, they're probably not going to like that. Alternatively, well, you have two options. You can go with the hatred. We just they just killed Bob. They're wearing Bob, they're wearing Bob's hat, you know, and now they'll they they've got blood in their eyes, or then fear of oh my gosh, they're wearing Bob's hat. <laughs> the blood is still fresh. Oh, we we're no match for Sting. We are no match for Sting. Um, but yeah, I would I I like that a lot. And I, I the only thing I would add was I'd want to give it. Give it some more resonance, maybe even in the town. If the town, if there's some relationship between wherever they're going, has seen these goblins or whatever, they're walking around and those trophies might be either impressive in its own macabre way or you know, disgusting. Now, the townsfolk might just be like, ew, why are you wearing that? And of course, you can think about rituals and other magic kind of things you might be able to do with these kinds of items, which actually I have another video that I'll do about that, but that. Gives me some ideas. Ideas. Okay, so we got, uh, we have a dragon in here. Is that a dragon? What is that? 
a dead dragon. There's an ochre jelly, a giant tarantula. Shadows, giant ants. Carnivorous apes, some more of the giant tarantula, some more giant tiger beetles, a compactor. There's a gargoyle. Oh, it looks like we have a, uh, a little bit of a puzzle here. Yep, we have a puzzle which that uses the Zodiac. A tapestry room, a library, and there's the player's handout with the Zodiac seal. And now we get the dungeon map. This is definitely upping the difficulty or the complexity, at least, from the uh, island fortress map. We have a whole, look at that, a whole bunch of secret doors here, some secret doors over here. Trap. Stairs, another secret door, more secret doors. More secret doors. Level two. More fun in the sun. Kyle says one of their players spread goblin blood all over themselves after that ambush. The attempt was to help him blend in as a goblin. He was a dwarf. It did not work. <laughs> Yeah, you know, sometimes I always, I know, I, I it's funny because I really think that there's a lot of these player stories. Like, I've had this happen with my group where my players will come up with something and they're just like, oh, yeah, this is great, right? Like this example, oh, yeah, I'm going to put, put goblin blood all over myself and then I'll blend in as a goblin. And I'll listen to it and I'll just think, okay. And then they'll kind of, and I'll say, like, all right, you got your plan. And they'll start to mention, like, all right, it's like, I just want to ask you, like, do you think... That coating yourself in the blood of a creature is going to make that creature think you're one of them. Like, is that really a thing? So, like, you know, or I might say, so okay, just, I just you know, I might say, all right, I, don't, I would say something like, I think my my standard line is something like, I don't want to dissuade you from this. But I just want to check in that if, say, a goblin covered itself in the blood of a human, you would take it to be human, or would you think this is a goblin covered in blood? <laughs> you know, and then oftentimes they'll go like, oh. And it's almost like they need to see it from outside. Like they get their, they're kind of wrapped in this world they have with, I don't even know what kind of rules working. And it's like, you have to, and then, but when hearing it from the outside back in, if I just line up and say, okay, so you're going to coat yourself in blood and you're going to think that that's going to make the goblins think you're a goblin. Oh yeah. Like most of the time they're like, oh, oh yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Does it? It's like, no, nah, you might want to, might want to think again. Think again, pal. But that's the end of the Nameless Dungeon in terms of the layout. I have some more loops in here, which I like. Now we get to the Cave of the Unknown, which I guess is the... I don't remember how many dungeons there are in here. It's the third. Let's see how they set this one up. So I'm not going to read all through this, but I do want to see how this is set up. So we have some intro text. You are relaxing in the Toothless Dragon, enjoying the ale and regaling the other patrons with the story of your latest exploits. A man enters wearing dirty, torn clothing with a worried expression on his face. He looks around the room, evidently still sun-dazzled, but then his eyes fall upon you and he quickly approaches. I am Cardin Carrion, a merchant. I heard from the Watchmen that you are capable individuals who might be available for hire. Is that so? Assuming the player characters... Oh, uh, lost the stream. Look at that. Almost made it the hour. I'm back. Son of a son of a mother budger. All right. I think I'm settled. Famous last words. Oops. There we go. Famous last words. Let me guess I was trying to monkey with that. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, I want full screen. Okay. So now we're on to the Back to where we were. So we're in the cave. So for the, the intro to the Cave of the Unknown, we're relaxing in the Toothless Dragon. Oh, back, back again. Yeah, back, 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 back. Relaxing a Toothless Dragon. Cardin Carrion, a merchant, comes and says, hey, are you available for hire? If we say yes, more or less, then the, then he goes on to say, my caravan was attacked north of here by orcs. I am the only man who survived, and then only because they thought me dead after they overturned my wagon. My daughter, Gwelaine, and her serving girl were taken by them into the forest. As soon as I recovered my senses and dragged myself from under the wagon, I came directly here to look for help. 
hunt them down for me. Rescue my daughter, and I will give you 800 gold pieces, all I have available right now. Will you help? So there it is. So it's a, it was a snatch and grab by some orc. <clears throat> and this uh, merchant wants to go get them. So there's your, there's your adventure hook. Now, on the GM, I'm curious if they give any altern alternatives, but it looks like this is basically it. Just a simple party for hire. <clears throat> Which you may need to flesh that out or do something different, depending on how finicky your party is with whoops, with their uh, plot hooks. Because one thing that I, I guess I've noticed after all these, we've definitely noticed before, they're not giving a lot of alternatives, right? The, the unknown dungeon is basically there's one way they're getting into that dungeon, and that's it. Uh, the uh, or the island one, there's really, I don't remember seeing any hooks at all that might have been in the Morgan's Fort information, so I don't want to say there weren't any. But it's kind of like, hey, it's there and it's close and it's low-hanging fruit sort of thing. You know, if your party ends up in town, like, where where can we go to, 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 to fight evil or something? You say, oh, the stuff coming out of that fortress. Great. This one, it's a rescue, a rescue mission, at least on the Soyphus. Ooh, Jurassic World minis. Uh, Brian Smith says, my insane players would be like, they didn't take your 800 gold pieces. Are you in on it? It's a setup. Kill quest giver. Well, I could say that he probably didn't have it on him. I mean, that's the classic. Like, I don't, you know, he's probably didn't have the money on him. It's probably in his home business. Let's see what the GM's info is. The orc lair is in a cave beneath a hill in the forest a few miles north of Morgan's Fort. It will not be hard to find as the wrecked caravan is easy to locate. And the orcs stupidly left numerous clues as to their direction of travel. However, the orcs don't have the woman anymore. Behind the more or less natural caverns in the orc lair lies another dungeon complex. So there's kind of two things here. We have the sort of surface level orc lair and beneath it or behind it is some other complex. Why don't they have the woman anymore? Uh, I guess we'll find out. So long ago, a powerful necromancer caused an underground complex to be built within the hill. The primary entrance is through the caves, the present orc lair. There's also an old well on top of the hill, which connects to room 19. It can be used as an entrance slash exit. It is recommended that the players not be told of this second entrance, though they may discover it by diligence or luck. The necromancer who lived and conducted research here left long ago. It is left as an exercise for the GM to detail this part if they wish. Deep inside the dungeon is the Altar of Darkness, a powerful evil magic item. A frustrated low-level necromancer named Sterizel Zalinth learned of the altar and traveled to the car to the caverns to obtain it. The altar has the power to animate the dead as zombies. Unfortunately for Starzel, the altar is too large to move, so he has had to learn about its powers on location. Starzel was a sickly individual, and staying in the cold, damp dungeon and handling the dead made his condition progressively worse. He finally convinced himself that the altar could make him a lich, a powerful undead wizard, if he poisoned himself while laying on it. Doesn't sound like a good plan. For several days, he gave himself small doses of arsenic until he felt quite sick. Then he laid down the altar and drank a large dose of the same poison mixed with a narcotic, and soon he died. The altar did its work, animating him as a zombie, but as he was also the person controlling the altar, he was animated in a self-willed form. The arsenic in his body prevents him from rotting, and he can still prepare and cast spells, and function mostly as though he was still alive. There was, however, a cost. Sterzel no longer has a pulse, and his body is cold. He has lost most of the sensation in his body as well so he no longer feels pain or pleasure. Finally, he has recently realized he can no longer improve his magical abilities. He has, in fact, been transformed into a type of monster known as a Zombrer. Interesting. I'd never heard of a Zombrer before. So I kind of like this, right? So there's this guy down there. He wants to work the altar. He discovers the altar. He finds the altar. He wants to work the altar. He wants to become a lich. This feels like he's just an old PC. I feel like a PC would have tried this. Decides the best way to do this is to poison himself and then kill himself on the altar, which works, but not the way he hoped, which also seemed to be very much like a player-made plan that's gone awry. But what's the connection between the worms and the spice? What does the woman and the orcs have to do with this poor guy? These limitations have largely cost him his sanity. He skulks around the dungeon looking for dead bodies he can animate and dragging them back to the altar. Assuming the player characters don't dispose of the bodies of any monsters they slay, Sterzel will collect them and animate them up to six per day as given in the description of the altar below. The PCs may begin to recognize the zombies they meet, especially if they leave a dead comrade behind. Oh, that's a nice twist. The tribe of orcs living here is unusual. It all started with a female orc named Badushna, who was cast out of her tribe because she was more beautiful, in quotes, than the chief, 
chief's head wife. She didn't wander the wilderness long because she knew the ogre who lived nearby would take her in. After all, she was beautiful, wasn't she? Kind of an interesting relationship they're setting up between ogres and orcs, but I guess. But Dushna isn't just a pretty face, though. She's smart, too, and has led the oak ogre Onig, or Onig, or Onig, to greater successes in looting and extortion than he could have ever done on his own. Their successes led to other outcast or rogue orcs, mostly males, joining them, and eventually they needed a larger home. Their search led them to the caves in front in the front of the complex. They quickly began regular raids on the caravans on the nearby nearby trade road, being careful to attack only the weakly defended caravans, and they became richer than any orc ever believed possible. Zalinth quickly learned of their arrival and considered destroying them, but by this time he had completed his transformation into an undead monster and became quite insane. He decided that he wanted a wife, and he would use the orcs to get one. In the night, he entered the quarters of Onig and Badushna, using a hold monster spell from a scroll to immobilize a sleeping ogre. His zombie minions grabbed Badushna as she awoke, and he quickly asserted his power over her by means of threats. He then told her that the orcs must capture an attractive maiden for him to be his wife, and if they did this, he would spare their lives. Onig overheard the exchange, but could not move to attack the necromancer and his minions. By the time the spell wore off, Zalinth was gone. Badushna saw him leave and knows of the secret door, but does not know anything about the room beyond. Under orders from Onig, or I don't know how to pronounce the name, I would say Onig, the orcs kept a lookout for attractive maiden among the caravans they robbed. Up to this point, they had avoided taking any hostages, as Badushna knew that, that capturing people was certain to lead to rescue missions. In a few days, they were successful capturing both the daughter of a merchant and her serving maid. They opened the secret door and shoved both women inside. Zalinth was pleased beyond belief and immediately imprisoned both women in cells. In Area 8, he promptly forgot about the serving maid, Saril, as he had no interest in her. He will not remember to give her any food or water, and so she may be in poor shape when found. That's kind of sad. He plans to take Gwilane, the merchant's daughter, to Area 23 at midnight. He will place her on the altar and pour a strong solution of arsenic down her throat. The transformation of his new wife will be complete by dawn. Thus, if the player characters do not find her before midnight, she will be dead or undead when they do. The merchant, Cardon Karian, will still pay the reward for his daughter if her body is returned to him. The serving girl is of no interest to him if, Gu if Gwilane is dead, and he will release her from his service at that point. The GM wish may wish to give the players 100 XP for each girl rescued alive as a bonus. It is recommended that the full bonus be given to each character involved rather than divided. All right, so... There's a little complex, we have a complex um, situation we have here. We have the this orc, sort of uh, outcast orcs with a lady lady orc chieftain and her ogre uh, consort, and then we have the necromancer. So th this setup is not very comp complicated on the surface, but it's got some interesting possibilities if we look kind of look beyond. What we're given a little bit right because just on the surface party you know goes through the or I, I imagine that you know okay party goes to the orcs finds the secret door maybe is told about the secret door then goes down goes through the monsters finds the necromancer now if i'm the orcs if i'm playing badushna i might really think about helping the party if the party can make it known what they're up to right we're not here for you uh, if, if actually, so there, so there's some interesting stuff here because the party is not here for the orcs. Their job was not to determine who attacked the caravan and did all the stuff, right? They're here for to get the girl back. If I'm the orcs, I will try to put all the blame as far as I can without making the necromancer aware that we're doing this on the necromancer. It wasn't us. It was the necromancer. We're scared to death of him, or we're scared to undeath of him. Here's the secret door. Go down and take care of him. Now, maybe on the way out, we might have some say about this. Though maybe if this was also the approach used on the Nameless Dungeon, I might not want to double up on having the bad guy, bad folk waiting for the party on their way out. But you get the idea here. Orcs are not, the Necromancer doesn't help the orcs. And they, we just said, Badushna, according to this, is smart. So he's probably smart to know I don't share this lair. I might not even control the best part of the lair myself. I've been sharing with this insane, crazy person, undead person. If this party will get rid of the undead person, that's great. They take the girl away. That's great. We put 
we put the blame of everything going on on the necromancer they kill the necromancer for us and then well when they come back out we can see we can try to figure out what's going on but get rid of them. like that's I, I feel like that's how i'd play it so you have some even though we don't you have the bones of it here but you're gonna have to if you want to make it something more or if you want to make it something less straightforward but perhaps richer just know that you're gonna have to go in there and uh, muck about with the ingredients yourself a bit you're gonna have to you're gonna have to sort of take the ingredients they've given you and add some butter add a little butter add a little salt saffron and 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 whip that up a little bit more brian smith likes the uneasy truce whatever the orcs end up doing it's more fun to delay the reveal yeah, I think that there's because uh, I think in here there's not really a reveal at all. It's just you're gonna go through the orcs, and you know, and, and you get there. I mean, right? I just think that's how it is, right? The orcs, and then you, you get into other parts. So you have kind of two dungeon elements. You have orc dungeon, then you have undead horror dungeon. But I think you can just have a little bit more. But the thing is, though, is I have to acknowledge that if the orcs give you a free pass through their part of the dungeon, that does shorten the dungeon a lot. If the orcs are like, yeah, here, just go down the other part. Then that does, you know, it does take whatever the size of the dungeon is and shrink it potentially by half. We'll look at the math, maybe we'll see kind of where it is. So you might need to uh, address that somehow. You could even have potentially a two orc factions. Maybe the ogre doesn't like this. Maybe, but I forget her name. What's her name? Uh, Banushka. Did I get that right? Badush, Badushna. Maybe Badushna is amenable, but then that's going to put her in conflict with the orc or with the ogre. And that could be an interesting thing. Like you can just make it right. We can add some factionality to it, add some dynamism, add some complex motives that you can muck around with a little bit more as opposed to just thwack your way through, uh, through the dungeon. And here we have the map and looks like, what is this? So here's, I see secret door here. Where's the secret door? Which one of these rooms? I'm not sure. We have a bunch of secret doors here. This was really not a big map. Is this is this area right here? Where's the altar? Uh, let's see. The altar room is 23. Where's 23? Maybe this is this. Is it the oh, maybe the cave could just be this area here. One, two, three, four. This might just be is room five already all necromancer? One, two, three four five i think that's it right and then you're in yep so i really think yeah i definitely would play around with the orcs and the ogre because they're only in these first three rooms everything else is necromancer city and then where's the altar rooms 23 is 19 20 21 22 where's 23 21, 22, there's 23. Over there. So that's how I do it. And then you get some pre-gens, and we're at the end of the book. Art needed. Surely you're joking. No, and don't call me Shirley. All right, so this was a Morgan's Fort, the Western Lands campaign. We get a uh, home base, big hex map, three different dungeons. I would say the dungeons two and three could use a little, little love. The first one, and again, apologies if I missed where these hooks are. It seems like the hook is just, hey, it's close, which is fine. That's actually not a big problem for me, depending on your group. They might be, if this is a new player's new campaign area, they might be itching to go somewhere and at the merest hint that there's just some kind of lair, dungeon, something, they're going to go running, running head over, head, you know, on all fours, just racing along the countryside to get there. It's within a day. It's close. It's within like a day, less than, yeah, much less than a day, right? I think it's very close. They get in the back, they can muck around. Now, once you get into dungeons two and three, we're given fairly simple, but simple and straightforward in their own way, hooks, but just one. Especially the second one, it's it could be a little bit of a could be a little bit of a trial, depending on how your party acts and reacts. 
I haven't seen it being a big deal. When I've read people talk about Morgan's Fort, I haven't heard them mention that that's a big issue to run it by the book. So you could try running it by the book, but you could also, I think, but I do think that that second dungeon, that would be the nameless dungeon, as well as the uh, third dungeon, which is called what again? The Cave of the Unknown. To use a little massaging. I think if you do end up massaging it, I think you end up with a, a richer experience. I think there's more fun to be had with the goblins if you play them as a little bit sneaky and um, sneaky and manipulative. Add some different layers in there. I just, I just think adds a little bit more fun. Not really in the dungeon delving part, which isn't going to change much, but in terms of the overall feel of it, the overall scenario, it just gives your party... I feel like it gives the players a little bit more to ponder about crosses double crosses who works for home you just have some more fun with that if you sort of give the goblins a little bit more agency besides just there i mean it, it, the fact is that by the book the goblins lure the party into the dungeon they don't even do it purposefully it's literally it's it's luring in a meta sense of i the gm i'm luring the party if i have the goblins act in this kind of weird weird way which but what you could do is you can really instead of doing that have the goblins really take agency over what they're trying to do and take actions and the party responding to those actions, I think creates a much more fun environment. And then for the third dungeon, the cave of the unknown, somewhat similar. The way it's set up is just a very simple search and rescue. Now, Brian Smith <laughs> brought up his party, his players that might look askance at somebody walking up with the sort of offer that the quest giver gives. But even just putting that aside, we have naturally two factions in the dungeon, but the dungeon itself doesn't really utilize them much. We have these the orc and ogre contingent, and then we have the necromancer. The way it stands is you kind of just plow through the orcs and the ogre and then get down and into it and plow through the necromancer's force until you reach it. But what you could do is have the orcs and ogre i think act a little bit more to their interest which would be if they know that people are coming and the the, the not the description does really hint to the fact that they've avoided taking hostages because they know that taking kidnapping will bring trouble so they haven't been doing it they know this so now they also know that they've now because they've helped the necromancer under you know from under duress help the necromancer that's bringing trouble so they should be expecting somebody showing up looking looking for these kidnapped victims knowing that it makes total sense that they would try to shift all blame to the necromancer <laughs> escort these folks through hope that they buy this stuff like hey we're just here we're outcasts we're just trying to trying to live our lives here in this cave away from anybody we we don't mean any harm but this necromancer he's doing bad stuff and we can't stop him because we're just scared poopless about it and then you can see how that shapes up and then you can even add i even thinking just well if that's too easy but it doesn't really feel like it's too much because the orcs are only orcs and ogre are only in the first three rooms so you're not really reducing the dungeon much in terms of its size if you have that faction act friendly but even if you wanted to spice it a little bit more have there be a schism in that faction with maybe the ogre doesn't want to do it or the orc wants to you can kind of have some more splits make it more interesting so there are great bones here you have this great expanse you can use this this seems like given the other parts of the uh, just what's on the map that you can see and then you can add in other basic fancy stuff a really good open area i just think that those dungeons you can just not the dungeons the layouts themselves but i think the 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 kind of connective tissue the sort of hooks and some of the stuff around it you can sort of spice a little bit more not a big issue it's just something that I would maybe want to read before I run it, just so I could go through there and add some extra wrinkles in there to just make it a little bit meatier, in a way. What, do you, folks? Before I before I uh, call this a stream, what do you guys think? Any thoughts? Any comments? Anybody run uh, Morgan's Fort? Any of this stuff be before? Have any uh, guidance in terms of what folks have been doing? Um, you know, what do you, what do you think if you've run it, if you haven't, obviously, and I, and again, I'm all this is from reading it. I have not run it, so I don't, I can't really say how it runs, but these are just kind of the, in terms of how I, how I feel like I could 
I don't, I don't want to say improve it. How I could just, I feel like add a little bit more complexity to it in a fun way. That's that's what I would do. But other than that, good stuff. And look, you, you know, I, I I may be, I don't want to be coming off as being, I don't know, a, 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 I'm certainly not disappointed in it. And it, they certainly are good, solid framework to build off of. And it's free, right? Let me just, let me just emphasize right here. These things are free. So, you know, you, you, you get it, you download it. It's free. It's, you know, 80 pages. You can go get them printed or you can get printed versions, I guess, for cost is what I'm hearing. But these are absolutely free by the community for the community around basic fantasy role-playing games. You can easily convert these for any other OSR game you're running. So are they perfect? No, but lots of things you people pay substantial money for are far more imperfect than these. And I think the things that I would want to fix or I don't know, fix for me, change for me, are smaller things that I think are A, easy to do. These are not super flawed adventures by any any stretch. That I would say, I mean, I did kind of breeze through. I didn't go detailed through the rooms and everything. So, you know, obviously there might be some things in there, but in, just in terms of the overall shape of things, just a few things that I would want to tweak, but that's easy stuff. And all I do is read through it and then I can make those tweaks. If I was prepping this for my home game, I could have, thought of the things I wanted to kind of tweak in just, you know, give me an hour or so before game time. I could easily make some little tweaks to the formulas, so to speak. Easy peasy. Uh, let's see. Brian Smith says, I love how little content you really need to get reskinning and flavoring. Absolutely. Add your own fixings for sure. Kyle says it's hard to pass up basic fancy role-playing content. Good bones, at least to massage fit your group slash campaign. Yep. Hey, Todd, fellow Todd Sharp says, Glad you're reading this. I had a copy and never got around to it. I would really like to use scenarios as drop-ins for my games. Uh, yeah, you could totally drop in. I mean, all of these would work as drop-ins. I mean, Morgan's Ford, if you need a location, just drop it and change the name. Put it by a river. You're pretty much set on the other dungeons. You could also drop in near your existing towns. The old Island Fortress just needs a, just needs a river that's large enough that it's a pain to cross and has a ruined bridge, I guess. I don't even know if the bridge really, the ruined bridge really enters into things very much and then the nameless dungeon yeah you could drop that in anywhere and came to the unknown just needs to be somewhat near uh, a trade route other than you can drag and drop these as far as the eye couldn't see um very very uh generic in a good way in terms of just being able to fit it into whatever framework you already have if you have a world and you just need some stuff to pepper your hexes with these will be perfectly fine pepper Ryan Smith says the drop-in piece of content with sufficient hooks leading to it is invaluable. Indeed. I think this is the first time I've looked at a piece of basic fantasy role-playing games content. And it's good. And, and, and it's all neatly done. You know, community effort. They will keep updating it. So I downloaded this originally not that long ago. And I think I had released 32. And now they're released 38. I don't know how much. I don't know how I don't know if I just, my timing or whether I just downloaded an older one by accident. I don't, so I don't know how often they're uploading it or updating it, but they're being worked on, you know? So even you can probably look at things you might, if there are any mistakes, probably be a good idea if you find a mistake in reading it to let the folks know, because I'm sure they'll update it. And then probably you might check back in a few weeks or months and there might be a new version with some updates to it as well. But yeah, this is a great, I'd say a really good starter. And, you know, the things I may fault it for or that I would look at want to fix myself. Certainly when you're comparing it to something classic like B2, it's not like B2 gives you a whole bunch more stuff or more sensical sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, hooks and things like that. I mean, one, you only have the one thing. Here you have three dungeons. Here you just have one. It's just that I'm really used to this. I, I can't read this like I haven't played it in my brain and messed around with it for eons, you know? So it has that kind of nostalgia shielding. This does not have, but yeah, this is great work. Um, and go grab it. And there's no reason not to download it, even just to give it a read and steal some things from it for your own home game. No reason at all because it is free. All right, folks. Who this one went over time. Sorry for the bit of technical difficulties about three quarters of the way through, but I'm glad I was able to get it resolved and get this done. Hopefully I'll be able to as I get settled in with the new equipment, I'll be able to smooth out this process. We shall see. That's all I got for now, everybody.
Oh, if you give a thumbs up on your way out, that would be awesome. And if you found yourself in here and you're not subscribed and you feel like subscribing, that would also be awesome. I have a Patreon. I want to thank them again because I had to get some buy some new equipment this week as my one computer aging is starting to crap out on me. It was an expense I was not looking for, but I was able to do that. And folks who've bought stuff and patrons and all this stuff have helped with that immensely. So thanks to them. Uh, game on, everybody. And I'll talk to you later. Hey, Krister. Bye now. Hey, Broughton. You missed it. Go back to the beginning and watch the stream. Bye.